Almost every climber knows that when you're training, you want to make it specific to rock climbing. However, not everyone knows how to make these exercises specific. In today's video, we're gonna give you the tools to figure out how to choose your own exercises and to make sure you know the specific for what you wanna achieve in your climbing. To start with, we need to understand a really important principle when it comes to training for any sport. And that is that an exercise is not necessarily specific, but the adaptations we get from an exercise is what is specific. Put simply, an exercise doesn't need to look or mimic a movement within the sport for it to be specific, as long as we gain a certain adaptation which is gonna benefit our sport. For example, a chest fly performed on a TRX might be seen as really specific to climbing because we are squeezing in using the chest, biceps and shoulders, and this looks and feels a lot like compression climbing when we're trying to crush something between us. Essentially, it feels like a pulling exercise. However, we might also look at a very similar exercise like a bench press where we're pushing away from us and consider this non-specific because we never have to push away from the wall in rock climbing. However, with the bench press, the adaptation is strength and recruitment within the chest muscles, the pecs, and the shoulders, the deltoids. And this will strengthen the muscles, which we are still gonna use in our sport. Therefore, the adaptations are specific to a certain style of rock climbing. In fact, there might be more benefits from a bench press because of its simplicity and its ability to progressively overload and get even more intensity and recruitment into the muscles, which we might not achieve very easily with something like a TRX fly. Now we're gonna go through a four-step process which you can use to select any exercise which will be specific and appropriate for any training goal you might have in your climbing. The first step we need to go through is identifying a movement in our climbing that we want to get better at. This might either be a move on a specific project that you have, a crux move where you want to really strengthen a certain area of the body, or it might just be a weakness that you've identified in your climbing that you want to make a strength. Let's go through two examples, one for the upper body and one for the lower body. The first movement we're gonna look at in the upper body is a hard undercling move. The difficulty here in this move for us is going to be keeping the tension through the lower hand as we make a move upwards again with the hand that's already above us. If we break down this movement a bit, essentially what we're trying to do is pull in with the lower hand towards the hip so that our hips stay close to the wall. This closeness of the hips to the wall is gonna help us reach our hand up again for this bump using the left hand. We can see here the upper arm stays kind of bent in this position as it's pulling us in and the elbows being tucked back towards the hip as that shoulder attracts to keep us close to the wall. The lower body example we're gonna look at is going to be a heel hook. In this example, we are using our leg to drive our hips into the wall as we make a reach. The leg needs to work really hard in this position so that we don't sink away as we reach with one hand towards the next hold. Step two of this process is to then identify the joints that are working in this movement. In this undercling position, we're looking at the elbow joint and the shoulder joint. These are gonna be the main joints involved in this movement. In the heel hook example, we're gonna be looking at the knee joint and the hip joint both working hard to maintain this position. Of course, when climbing, it's always a full body activity. So there are multiple joints, if not all of your joints being active and stabilizing the position. What we're trying to look at when we identify the joints working here are gonna be the ones that are working the hardest or the limiting factor. So obviously in the heel hook example, the ankle joint is also doing quite a lot, but the ankle is probably working mostly just to create the profile of the heel, but the ankle joint might not be working as hard as the knee or hip to create or stabilize the movement. Step three is to identify the muscles that are working around these joints to create that action. Now here a little bit of anatomy comes in handy, but if you don't have good anatomy of the joints and muscles, a simple Google search can normally help you out. So if you look for what bends the elbow, you should define the muscles that are involved in elbow flexion. In our undercling lock-off example, the muscles that are moving primarily to keep that elbow flexed, that is going to be the biceps, and for the shoulder joint to keep the elbow towards the hip, this is gonna be the lats. At this point, with the undercling lock-off, you might be thinking that there's gonna be loads of other muscles involved more than just the biceps and the lats, and that is absolutely correct. If we just think about the shoulder joint, for example, we have the rhomboids and the traps that are gonna be big muscles fixating this movement, at least trying to stabilize it as we're moving. But for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna look at the prime movers in this example, and that's where we're gonna focus our training. 
For our heel hook, the prime movers of this movement are going to be the hamstrings and also the glutes. Now that we've identified which muscles we want to train, we want to find some exercises which are going to target those muscles. If that feels really simple, it's because it is, and most people are gonna benefit from keeping it really simple. So what we wanna do now is to find good exercises which are going to train the biceps, the lats, the hamstrings, and the glutes. The easiest thing to do at this point, if you don't know exercises which are going to target these muscles, is just to Google it. Google exercises that will train the biceps, that will train the hamstrings. Not every exercise you find is going to be a great exercise, so a few things that I would generally look out for when selecting the plethora of exercises that you might find for training the biceps are, one, an exercise that easily allows progressive overload. So although there's a lot of convenience about using bands or straps, they're less easy to measure and progressively overload. So generally, I would always go for something that is using free weights or machines. Two is try to keep the exercise simple. If it looks really complex and you think it's going to take ages to learn because either it's a difficult skill-based calisthenics move or it's a big multi-compound lifting exercise, which you probably need to get some coaching with, I'd generally steer away from that and just go for something that looks like it's easy to do. Three would be to make sure this exercise is stable. So I would stay clear of a lot of these kind of balancey rehab-based exercises where they're based on building your proprioception and will just basically improve your ability to do the exercise but have limited transfer to your climbing because it's not gonna be about strength development and recruitment it becomes more about learning a skill. And number four would be pick an exercise that is convenient for the equipment you have. We're gonna go through hamstring exercises in a minute and we're actually gonna breeze over probably some of the better exercises for the equipment we have available in our gym. Number five would be considering muscle length. So this kind of goes back to the very beginning with analyzing the movement. If you're trying to do a move where you're really stretched out or really bunched up in a position, consider if the muscle that you've identified is working hard in a short position or a long position or if it's working through a full range of motion. We get strong in the range we train and research does show that if we train partials, we get stronger in the partial range of motion. And if we train just at our end range, we get stronger in our end range. So we should consider that when looking at how we perform an exercise or the exercise we choose. So into the exercises, we're gonna choose for the undercling lock-off position. This is gonna be a bicep curl to train the strength of our biceps. And it's gonna be a low row for training the strength of our lats and that scapular retraction. For the heel hook, we wanted to train the hamstrings and the glutes. Now, I think actually one of the best exercises you can do for the hamstrings is doing a hamstring curl machine. It's just a really easy and effective way to get targeted intensity into the hamstring, easily progressively overload, nice stable exercise, but a lot of gyms, at least here in the UK, don't have hamstring curl machines. So we have to try and adapt for a more convenient exercise. So the exercise we're gonna choose is a stiff legged deadlift, mainly because it's super convenient and really easy progressively overloaded. And I just also really enjoy this exercise. As we mentioned in our previous video, I actually said enjoyment was probably one of the biggest factors which goes into selecting an exercise in your training program. And this means I'm just gonna stay more motivated and stay more consistent with it. This exercise also brings in another consideration when it comes to choosing your exercises and that is we're training both the hip and knee the hamstrings and the glutes at the same time so we can decide to use an exercise which trains multiple muscles and crosses multiple joints or we can try and isolate the muscles by choosing something like a hamstring curl and a hip thrust which is going to get more activation into just the hamstrings or just the glutes depending on which exercise you're doing Arguably, there may be more benefits to separating these exercises and working more on the hamstrings independently and more on the glutes independently because you're going to get better strength training with those individual exercises for that targeted area. But again, it comes with a pros and cons. This is going to be more convenient for me and more time efficient because I'm just going to do the one exercise. By this point, we can be confident that our exercises are specific to our sport or specific to the movements that we're trying to train. However, there's one more step which is going to make your exercises even more specific to the adaptations we are trying to achieve. And that's because the adaptations to an exercise will vary depending on the velocity that you perform the exercise at. In pretty much every circumstance, you want to be trying hard and working at a high level with all of your strength training, but the velocity is gonna be dependent on the weight you use. So if we're using a light weight, the velocity should be high. 
If we're using a heavy weight, the velocity naturally will be low because of how fast your muscles can contract when lifting a really heavy weight. If we lift a light weight for multiple reps and approach failure, or at least a close proximity to failure, the velocity of that muscle contraction will slow down and we'll be gaining a good strength training effect, but there'll be a high level of hypertrophy or muscle growth with this form of exercise. Alternatively, we could lift a really heavy weight for less reps. The muscle contraction would be slow because it's heavy and we can't move it fast. And here we're gonna get a better adaptation to our strength gains and to the tendon adaptation as well. For most climbers, working at a high load in a slow velocity is gonna be great for strength gains and recruitment. However, there's also gonna be certain cases where hypertrophy is gonna be really beneficial. The third option is lifting a light weight for a low number of reps, but with maximum velocity and maximum intent. Here, our strength will be expressed more through speed. That's how we're gonna express it better on the wall if speed is needed in our movement. We're gonna be getting a good adaptation to our tendons, but less so in the muscle building and hypertrophy. The reason you might want to use high velocity exercises in your training, and you can do this for most of the examples we've done today, you would just have intent of moving the bar as fast as possible with a lower weight than you would if you were training for maximum strength. We might choose to do this if, for example, this undercling position was actually trying to drive a lot of power into the wall for a right-handed move, for example, like a pogo move. It is worth considering, however, that gains in maximum strength will transfer to gains in velocity. So if we wanna make it more complex and think about periodization, you can layer these things into your training plan. You could start with maximum strength, still see gains in power, but then taper into a more high velocity focus and see even further gains in that power development. Making your strength training specific to climbing is all well and good. And in fact, actually for some people, it might be overrated. And we see this a lot where people might do relatively unspecific training, but they still see huge benefits in their climbing. And why is this? There's actually a few circumstances where training doesn't really need to be specific for you to see gains in your climbing. One example of this is in beginners or novices, and it doesn't even need to be beginners in climbing. They could be advanced climbers, but have never lifted weights before or done any form of strength training. Someone that starts strength training for the first time might see a quite quick transfer of any of this non-specific strength move into their actual climbing skill. With this in mind, if you've never done any strength training before, the biggest recommendations I would give you is pick an exercise you think you're gonna enjoy and you're gonna stay consistent with. Eventually, you're gonna see diminishing returns with this and then you might wanna start making your strength training more specific, but for the time being, it's probably not that important. The second area in which strength training can be non-specific but transfer to your sport is in hypertrophy. Essentially, bigger muscles can produce more force and more force can be beneficial to your sport. It doesn't necessarily need to be that specific. Of course, there's also circumstances where hypertrophy or increase in muscle size might not be wanted in certain areas because that increases our weight and might actually have a negative effect on our strength to weight ratio in our fingers. The third non-specific benefit is that if you're strength training to improve your health and your ability to recover, then that's gonna benefit your climbing in general. It doesn't need to necessarily have a direct transfer to performance. So if you're doing metabolic conditioning or cardio, it's not gonna be very specific to your climbing performance, but in the long run, it might improve your performance because you have less time off, you're recovering better, and you feel better generally within your sessions. I would like to know what exercises you have done or chosen in your programming, which have improved a certain move or style of climbing. Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.